Welcome to Living a Full Life Podcast. Join us as we explore health topics that encourage raising healthy children, living a healthy life, and living the best life possible. Now, here's your host. Welcome to another episode of Living a Full Life. I'm Dr. Enrico Dolce Cori, and I will be helping you today. We're talking about lean muscle mass. Uh, as the new year comes around, everyone's working out, trying to get healthy, lose weight, exercise, do all those things. And this is one that's great for men and women. This is a great episode talking about lean muscle mass. Let's talk about the myths and the facts of lean muscle mass, what it is, what it really means, and what they really are, what you need to focus on depending on your age group. As we get older, we don't lose lean muscle mass. What happens is it's harder to maintain lean muscle mass. So what is lean muscle mass? Why should we even focus on lean muscle mass? What do we need to do about our muscles? And really, th there's a difference when it comes between um, lean muscle mass and fat. We need to know to distinguish the both. Both of them, we all make fun of the fat. We all hate the fat. We hate this stuff. But there's two different tissues on the body. And uh, lean muscle mass weighs more in volume than fat does. So uh, gaining 10 pounds of fat is noticeable. Gaining 10 pounds of muscle, not so much. Well, that's actually quite noticeable as well. 10 pounds is a lot, but those are two very different things. Uh, so we need to know what's different. Muscle is significantly denser than fat, and a pound of muscle takes up about 20% less space than a pound of fat. So it it's, takes up less space. The function, muscle tissue plays an active role in your body. It controls every movement that you do in your body. You can't move without muscles. And it generates heat and stabilized joints. Fat tissue, on the other hand, mainly serves as an energy storage and insulation. Those are its two functions. So we need a little bit of both. So you hear these people, you know, 2 3% body fat. That's very, very, very lean. And the visceral fat will be very low as well. That be, There's danger areas with that as well. So visceral fat at a certain point is good. The brown fat is good, but then the rest of the cellulite that we talk about in the body is the rest of our fat. And that is a percentage based on your height and weight that we'll get into in a second. So from an appearance from the outside in, muscle gives your body a toned and defined look while fat tends to contribute to a softer and bulkier appearance. And that's just the common conceptions we have out there and the trouble areas that we talk about when it comes to weight loss and exercise and all these things. So I want to set up a healthy dialogue about muscle and fat and our body and, and how we look at it. So health and fitness implications, there's a few things we need to look at when it comes to getting fit or doing anything when it comes to our health. We need to look at a four main points really is metabolic rate. We need to understand what our metabolic rate is, our insulin sensitivity level, our strength and performance, and our overall health from a from an eagle's eye view. So before we jump into things like extreme diets or extreme workouts, we need to understand those four things. So metabolic rate is muscle has a higher metabolic rate than fat, meaning it burns more calories even at rest. This can lead to a higher overall calorie expenditure and easier weight management. So understanding our metabolic rate, that's what it is. Insulin sensitivity, muscle cells are more insulin sensitive than fat cells. Means, which means your muscle cells react to insulin much quick, much more quicker than your fat cells, which means they take up glucose more readily, helping to regulate blood sugar levels. So it's actually our lean muscle mass that helps regulate our blood sugar levels. Just a quick little biology lesson about sugar is once we ingest sugar, sugar starts to digest in our mouth. The enzymes in our saliva react to simple sugars and carbohydrates first. They start to break it down by the time it gets to the stomach. That's why they taste so good. We break it down in our mouth. We change the flavors of it. We feel that the sugar dissolve. And, that, and even from carbs, it can come from bread, from rice. The stuff tastes good immediately because our enzymes in our mouth are starting to digest it. So by the time it gets to the stomach, it's easily digested and absorbed very quick. Protein takes a little bit longer. The hydrochloric acid in the stomach has to take a little bit longer to break that stuff down. And fat chains have to be broken in the stomach as well and absorbed later on in the digestive tract. So we need to understand those few things there. Once we break down the simple sugars into glucose, fructose, 
sucrose, whatever it may be, they break into those chains and they, and they enter into the bloodstream. This is where if enough of the sugar starts flowing into our bloodstream and we absorb it, we start to release insulin hormone. It's a hormone from the pancreas. It's triggered through the pituitary. So we, we do this and we start to release insulin. Insulin is a transporter. It goes and binds to all the, the sugar in the blood and it brings it to the lean muscle first. And the muscle, the gatekeeper at the muscle says, let's, let's, we need glucose. We need to fill the reserves in our, in our muscles and they convert it to glycogen. And those glycogen stores are in the, in the muscle. And once those reserves are full, then anything flowing in the bud, bloodstream goes and gets processed through the liver and converted to fat storage. Every process does this. Even excessive fat or triglycerides in the body will go to the liver, get synthesized, and be stored as fat. Even excess protein. Everything that's in excess will be synthesized through the liver and converted. So our goal is to find the middle ground. We'll get into that in a second. Okay, so that's insulin sensitivity. So because the muscles are so demanding for glucose and, glyc and to convert it to glycogen, they're the ones that want this. Now, what are these energy stores in muscle? The energy stores in our muscle are pretty much used based on what we do during the day. Our basal metabolic rate uses muscle energy. So we're just by sitting and standing and walking and just bending and tying our shoes, just the little things that we need to do each and every day has a basal metabolic rate that consumes a certain amount of energy. We measure this all through calories because that's the unit of energy that we measure, but we can do this through grams and through micronutrients that go through there as well. So that's what that's why the muscles need it first. Fat really doesn't demand much. Like the fat cells in our body are not demanding for more for more carbs or more fat to be developed. They're just there to store for a rainy day or for a famine or for starvation or hibernation or whatever it is that we're doing. Maybe we don't find food for a while, right? We're still programmed paleolithically before all of modern civilization to survive. So that's the thing there. We'll circle back to all of this in a second. Strength and performance. We need to know the health and fitness implications, right? We talked about strength and performance. Building muscle mass can increase your strength, power, endurance, and improve performance in physical activities. We know this. The stronger and more enduric a muscle is, the more we can do without for longer, for longer periods of time, which is great. That's why we want to maintain lean muscle mass and keep it active for both strength and endurance. Overall health has a huge implication to our outcomes. So having a high, higher muscle mass to fat ratio is associated with a lower risk to various chronic diseases and inflammatory diseases, such as heart disease, diabetes, and even most types of cancers. So there is an overall health implication to lean muscle mass and staying fit. But some of these, what happens, what happens if we do have diabetes or what happens if we do have some heart condition or what happens if we've gone through cancer in the past? These are things we have to look at before we throw people into excessive diets. So we're going to dive in here, but both muscle and fat are essential components of the body, but having a healthy balance is crucial for optimal health. Like we talked about being super lean, like on the front of muscle magazine is not fitness. And if you go to some of these celebrities who've trained for these major roles, like, um, Ryan Reynolds with his, uh, Marvel stuff and, um, Deadpool Thor who played Thor, Kristen Hemsworth for Thor, um, Wolverine, all these guys that have gone through these major cuts, even uh, Chris Pratt, you know, th and they have it on their social media and they, they, they joke about the process and the, the extremes that they go to to look like that. Uh, and it's also edited, by the way. But to go through that, Ryan Reynolds has said flat out, like, this is not sustainable. Like, the, what I did for this was, was painful and it was hard to maintain for the, for the shoot. And immediately when we were done, I gained 15 pounds. Like I, I went back to normal uh, because it's impossible to maintain that. Not impossible, but it's not healthy to maintain that long periods of time. So I, I may get a couple arguments from this, but I highly doubt it because that low muscle or body fat ratio is unhealthy. It's hard for the body to stay there. You won't be able to maintain that for long periods of time for years. Building muscle mass can offer numerous benefits in the process of building it, including increasing your metabolism, improving that insulin sensitivity that we talked about, enhance strength and performance, and reduce the risk of those chronic diseases that we talked about. Focusing on healthy eating, 
regular exercise, and adequate sleep are key factors in promoting a healthy, lean muscle mass and reducing body fat. That is the introduction to this podcast. Let's dive in to lean muscle mass. Your age plays a role, whether you're 30 or 60. Those are two ends, the two different ends of the spectrum here. 30 and 60 are different. 30, you're still considered youth, you know, in the youth category, 20 to 30 age. And if you're 60, 60 to 70, you're moving into the geriatric ages. So in between there, I find that 30 to 60 group is I can, I consider them all equal playing field in there. We're all middle aged and we're playing in that battlefield. So most of these rules apply to that category. If you're 20 or if you're 70, we have to modify some of the things that I'm going to say here. But first step first, when, when doing this for your lean muscle mass is you got to calculate your maintenance calories. Almost virtually all Americans don't even know what their maintenance calories are. We were duped in the nineties with the caloric labeling on our food packages through the uh, politicians that pass those acts and nutrition showing that the 2000 calorie diet was an average diet. It's not true. And listen to this. The amount of energy your body needs to function at rest is how you calculate this. So you multiply your body weight. doesn't matter if you feel like you have too much body fat right now or not. Whatever your weight is right now in pounds, you multiply that by 14. And this becomes your maintenance calorie base. This is pretty much what you need to maintain the weight that you're at. So if you're 150 pounds, I mean, that's 2,100 calories. Make sense? If you're 200 pounds, that's 280 or 2,800 calories. You guys see where that is? So already a 150 pound male and a 200 pound male are both over the 2,000 calorie recommendation that they put out there in the 90s. So we've been we've been messed up. So drop the 2,000 calorie thing and figure out what your number is. Then you need to adjust that. So that is your base caloric maintenance caloric maintenance this is not your basal metabolic rate this is your just your maintenance weight just a good mathematical equation for that that's roughly accurate very accurate adjust your activity level so now you have to be honest with yourself are you lightly active moderately very active or extremely active very few people are extremely extremely active might be like somebody like a personal trainer who's helping doing their their own workouts during the day and helping other people through their workouts. So hopping on the floor and be like, no, no, this is how you do your form. You want to bend the elbows. You want to do the push-ups like this. So they did, they just finished their workout at 6 a.m. And now at 2 p.m. They're showing other clients how to do push-ups on the floor. That would be somebody who's extremely, and they go play volleyball in the afternoon for rec, rec and all that. So they're super active. That would be a, a very active person. A lightly active person is someone maybe with a desk job that goes for walks daily. Make sense? So that's a light. If you are a no active person, you have to be honest with yourself. Be like, I do nothing. I don't have a dog. I don't walk. I don't do any. Be honest with yourself. Then that, that body weight times 14 is your activity level maintenance. That's where you're at. So if you eat more than that, you're going to gain weight. And if you eat less than that, you should lose weight, but you won't. And that's the problem. So understanding that. So for many of you listening, you're going to be lightly to moderately active. A few of you, very active. So here's the the calculations. Take that number, and if you're lightly active, multiply it by 1.2. So you're going to add 20% calories to your to your 2100 if you're 150 pounds. If you're moderately active, you're going to do 1.5, 1.55 to be exact, but 1.5. Okay. And if you're very 1.75, and if you're extremely two, you can double your calories, but imagine eating 4,200 calories a day. So don't see why we can't go there. So do not go there. So lightly or moderately, you got to just choose. So a lightly active person is somebody who goes for a walk, doesn't really elevate their heart rate every day, but moves a little bit, gets their steps, maybe gets, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10,000 steps a day. Moderately active is somebody who goes to the gym, maybe has like a two, three time a week gym protocol that they do. That would be somebody who's moderately active. Very active would be gym protocol plus plays, you know, hockey in the, in the evenings, three times a week, um, and goes uh, every day, goes for a jog or goes for a walk. That'd be a very active person. Okay. So 1.2, 1.5 for most of you, maybe 1.75 for the very active crew. We good so far. So the, the, the 20, the 150 pound male or female is going to times it by 14 
we're going to get to 2,100 calories for our base caloric maintenance. Then we're going to adjust it as, let's say you're moderately active, 1.55. We are now at 3,255 calories, the adjusted. Okay? So this is where we start to measure protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Okay? Are we doing okay? So determine your protein intake. This is crucial for muscle repair and growth. You want to aim for about one gram of protein per pound. Again, if you're at 150 pounds, you want to eat 150 grams of protein to maintain your lean muscle mass. What do you need to do if you want to increase muscle mass? Increase that. Set your fat intake to 20%. This is just a great rule. Some say 20 to 30%. I say 20% of your, your caloric intake. So if your caloric, your adjusted caloric intake is 3,200 calories, 20% of that, 640 calories per day can come from fat. That's under 100 grams a day because 100 grams of fat is 900 calories. So that would be about 60 grams of fat per day, okay? Using apps like MyFitnessPal and those types of things that track micro, my, macronutrients is great. I love it. Use it for a month or two. You know, you do it for 30 or 45 days straight, and you'll get a general idea of where your macronutrients are coming from. Then divide the remaining calories that are left after you've determined your protein, 150 grams. After you've determined your fat, 60 grams. D divide the remaining carbo uh, calories between carbs and protein. So the remaining calories after fat come from carbohydrates and protein which can be very depending on the preference of your fitness goals, 40 to 60% carbs and 35% protein is a common starting point. Okay. So let's go through this and just kind of 150 pounds is just a simple math to do. We're at 2,100 calories of, because we times that by 14, um, basal metabolic. That's what we need for our resting caloric intake. We adjust it because we're moderately active. We're now eating 3,200 calories a day to maintain the workouts that we do. Our protein is calculated at 150 grams. Our fat intake is, you know, 20, let's say 25% of 3,200 calories becomes 90 grams. And our carbs and protein that are remaining is the 3,200 calories minus 800 calories for the uh, fat minus 150 grams of protein times four. So that would be 600 calories from the, the protein equals 1491. I'm sorry for all these numbers. As I'm saying this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm losing everybody. So what's left with your carbs and protein is 1500 calories. So if the carbs are 50% and the protein's 50%, it leaves you with about 750 calories of, of carbs and 750 calories of protein. We're going to get into something. This is maintenance, right? Like this is maintaining calories for somebody who's active. So now, now we know what to eat. And then th these are just general guidelines. So now the factors we need to look at is body composition. We need to know our fat percentage, our training program, and our food tolerances and preferences. We need to know what we can and can't eat. Some of us have allergies. Some of us are intolerant. So when we're getting into this stuff, it takes a little bit of help. And the reason we have... So I'm going to give you my personal story. Why, Enrico, why are you doing this podcast? You're not Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, I'm not. But I've been on a journey and I'm on a 24-month journey personally that I've tried trying things through my personal goals. And without getting into too much details about myself, I'm going to tell you the story. Last May, a gym close to my house opened up, a brand new gym. Everyone, I swear, everyone in town is a member. The thing's packed. But anyways, I go there and I started and I hired a coach out of Utah. He's a fellow chiropractor and bodybuilder. And I'm like, man, we're about the same age. Help me out. What's going on? So he set up a whole training program for me and how to eat with protein. And the protein for me, I, I weighed at when I started was 210 pounds. And he's like, you got to eat 240 grams of protein per day. He was keeping that one or 1 1.2, right, uh, of protein for me. And I want you to do this workout program four times a week. It was chest, back, legs, shoulders. And we just repeat every week. And I've been doing this consistently for seven months. I have the Tanata body composition thing in our office that I use for all of our weight loss uh, clients. And I've been keeping track at least once a month of what's going on. I have gained 10 pounds of lean muscle mass on this thing and I weigh 208 pounds. I bear, I'm, a, I'm exactly the same weight as I was last May 
I'm frustrated because I'm working so hard. I'm like, why am I not losing weight? But he's like, remember, the weight doesn't matter. Your, your trimmer, you've lost 20%. So of the 10 pounds of lean muscle mass that you put on, you've obviously lost 10 pounds of fat. Like pretty easy to determine that because you've stayed about the same weight. Do you, do you feel any trimmer? I'm like, absolutely. We're taking pictures every, you know, two weeks or so. He, and then we can see it. The shoulders have definitely put on a lot and my upper back has put on a lot as well. I can tell my wife can tell people can tell. I've, so that's great. So the lean muscle mass is there and I can measure it quantifiably with the technology I have in my office, which is awesome. So we can see this. So I'm like, my metabolism should be going up, right? We should be, I should be losing weight. And, and I'm just like most of my patients with the trouble areas and wanting to lose weight. But this time I'm on a journey to do it permanently. I want to see permanent change with permanent health effects. So that is the cool thing about it. Consistency is key here and it works. And for the first time fueling myself, man, 200 grams of protein is a lot. I was eating egg whites for breakfast, peanut butter, uh, a protein shake once a day, tons of chicken um, and trying to cut the carbs and, and very little fat. He had me on a low fat diet with more carbs because of the working out, which makes sense. So that's why you need a little bit of guidance with this. But this podcast was about lean muscle mass and we need to know those numbers. So I hope we abolished this $2,000 or 2000 calorie lie that we've been told. It fits no one's diet. Very few people. To hit what you have to be like, what 139, like exactly 139 pounds, and then your maintenance calories is 2,000. So, if you're 139 pounds, I guess you fit that one 2,000 calorie maintenance that the government said most people do. That's not true. The average weight of an adult American in America, you ready for this? It's 215 pounds. The average weight of an adult American. Adults over the age of 18 is 215 pounds. All of you that are under 150 pounds are like, wait a second, we're bringing that number down. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, that just means how many more people are heavier than 200, 200 pounds. So it just shows you where, you know, where we're at. So no one fits the 2000 calorie thing. I don't know where this came from. So very, very bad. Where, what that nutritional guideline is, is for sodium trans fats and fats. That's where they got that from. They said, well, listen, at 2000 calories, we shouldn't be, no one should be exceeding this much sodium and this much trans fat. And for that, they're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. We should not be eating that much at all, but that is not your base metabolic rate. So really important to know that some of you are like, man, I can eat 3,200 calories a day. And like, you have to eat 3,200 calories a day just to maintain what you got. And I've noticed that myself too. I have to eat the food. I got to get that food in. Otherwise, nothing's happening. And it's made a big difference. So now we're into like, you know, into month eight of this program. It's a 24-month journey. He told me this takes a year just to get some body composition going. Then we're going to get into other things. So now we've realized, he's like, dude, you're the first person I've helped after eight months to not shrink. Like you should just be, he's like, you should be there. You should be at the goal that you wanted to be at. Something's going on, and we know what's going on. It's testosterone. Uh, we, we've known this behind, and I re re have refused to do anything hormonally. I just It's through food, diet, and exercise my whole life. It's always been, I'm never going, you know, never going to. We got into peptides. So started the whole peptide thing, and I am teetering on TRT through all the groups that I've been in and talking to other doctors and professionals like Enrico, you're 40. Things change, and if you maintain this low 305, 323, uh, free testosterone for years through your 30s, you're on the low end. You really are. And multiple people have told me this, and all of them look at me and they're like, you need, you, your only option is TRT. So I'm thinking about it, but uh, that's where we're at with this. So these are the, the limits of matter, right? The, the, the limitations of our matter, of our body. It's just the way, and you got to listen to these things. Now, do I want to compete? Do I even want to do TRT? Do I want to do any of this stuff? Do I care? No. My heart's healthy. I'm healthy. My blood work's healthy. Why would I want to mess with this stuff at all? And my very few symptoms, I don't have symptoms. My energy's good. All that stuff's good. So I'm giving you my personal story about this. I'm 40. I'm in the middle of the crowd. I think I'm relatable when it comes to this. Um, but that's my story. And it's very different uh, than your story. So knowing the math and having someone guide you and help you can do that. I am by no means an expert. 
but we always help our patients through this stuff. And we can guide you in the right direction with personal trainers, nutritionists outside of our office and through our network around the country that we can help you get the goals that, that you're looking to get to. So if you have questions about this stuff, not only do we do it personally, but we help tons of people through our practice do this as well. And uh, we love answering these types of questions. It's fun to help people along their health journey. And our number one goal, my number one goal through even this podcast is to do it healthy, naturally, and in excellence. That is, that's how we want to follow the path of our health. So get out there, do what you love. That's how you're going to stick with it. I don't love the gym. The thing that got me sticking to this is he's like, I don't want you running or doing excessive cardio or anything aggressive. I was like, really? So what do I do? He's like, you do the four, the four workouts in the gym. It takes you about 30, 40 minutes each. And then I want you to get on the treadmill and walk with a little bit of an incline for 45 minutes. Do that four, five, six times a week. I'm like, can I get on the Peloton? He's like, yeah, switch, switch the Peloton for a light bike ride. Stay at 125 beats, 130 beats per minute with your heart rate. Do not excessively work out. I was like, okay, I like this because <laughs> I hate cardio. So I was like, okay. And it's boring. The treadmill is boring, but I'm getting it done. And uh, that worked for me, see? And we found a program that worked for me, and I actually thoroughly enjoy it. And I've been going eight months with minimal injuries. That My uh, tricep has been a little tight from all the skull crushers. So I stopped skull crushers and switched it with some other stuff. And, the, and I'm a chiropractor, and I know how to heal the stuff. So I can get through them. But that's my story. And I'm working through it and through my journey. And I thought if I did a couple podcasts through the year, keeping you updated about it, maybe it motivates some people to – stick with it as well. But if you have questions, we're here for you. Info at fulllifetampa.com. That's where Living a Full Life podcast is stationed. Uh, Anywhere in the country, reach out to us. We've got tons of providers now all over the place that can help you. Stay well, stay healthy, and have a great week. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Living a Full Life podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.